Welcome, early American literature friends. This video is a short guide through the first third of Narrative of the Captivity and Restoration of Mary Rowlandson. Uh, this video is going to discuss that beginning section up through the seventh remove. So it gets you through the first seven removes and the beginning section um, about the attack on Lancaster and her capture uh, with her daughter. Um, I want to talk just for a moment to get us started about Mary Rowlandson, the person outside of the book, and especially her life before and after this incident. Uh, this happens, uh, the Mary Rowlandson is captured in, on February 10, 1676. She is born in 1637 in England. Uh, she and her family leave sometime before she's 13 years old. There's some dispute about how early she might have come to this country when she was three, as young as three years old or as old as 10 or 11 years old. They come to the Massachusetts Bay Colony and then she marries her husband, the Reverend Joseph Rowlandson, her son. You don't see him in this book until very near the end when she is uh, ransomed back uh, from the Native Americans. But her son is also named for her husband, Joseph. Uh, they have four children between 1658 and 1669. Um, and then she, he, the way that she ends up in Lancaster is, which is a frontier town at that time period, it is on the very frontier of the Massachusetts Bay Colony and the frontier with the Native American tribes. With that westward push of the colonists and settlers, they have made it as far west as sort of central Massachusetts. Um, Lancaster is a frontier town, which is why it is attacked and she is captured. Her husband is assigned to be the pastor of the main church there, um, but he is away when the town is attacked. He is over either in Boston or near Boston, but east and not in town um, when their home is attacked, which is why he is not captured. Um, the attack and then sh the town is attacked on February 10, 1676. She is held prisoner for 10 or 11 weeks. Uh, her youngest child, Sarah, uh, who is six years old, uh, is wounded and then dies in this section, this first section. Uh, she is held captive for more than 11 weeks. She is returned uh, after the attack. In 1677, Reverend Rowlandson moved his family to Wethersfield, Connecticut. He is assigned to a different parish after all of these events that happened. He dies uh, just the next year, um, and the town officials grant her a pension because she was somewhat of a celebrity having survived this attack. But then she and her children moved to Boston in the late 1670s. Uh, she, that is where she writes this book and tells the story of her capture. Um, this book is, the first edition of this book is published in 1682. Um, and then she remarried and, uh, to a man named Captain Samuel Talcott in 1679. Uh, she dies, which is why initially early on there was some belief that she had died. She had changed her name because she had remarried. And then she lives for any number of, she lives for a good long while after this attack, after the death of her husband, after her remarriage, her second husband also passes away. She does not die until 1711 um, when she's 73 years old. And so she survives for a good long while after this attack and has almost a second life after this attack um, with the death of her first husband, her remarriage, her move to Boston. And so this event, which has become the most famous part of her life, and understandably, but it is sort of, she she has a life before this where she has several of her children, lives through this captivity period in the winter and spring, um, and then has a long life after this. Uh, this all happens in 1676. The other thing that's important to understand is you see this note here, um, this attack is part of what is now called King Philip's War. King Philip was the king of the unified tribes of like the Narragansett, the Wapanoags, especially the Wapanoags, um, and the Nashua Nipmuc Indians. Uh, by the time you, this is, happens in the middle of King Philip's War, but by the time you get to the end of King Philip's War in a year or two, um, all, this is, King Philip's War is important because it is really, when it is over, it is the end of significant Native American resistance to the British colonists in New England. It is the last, it is sort of their last stand against the attempts by the British colonists to take over essentially what becomes all of New England. And so when King Philip's War is over, the Native American tribes 
they have not been eradicated, but, but their ability to resist the British colonists and to stop the British pushing further west into New England, it, it, it's over. The British have taken New England, or it's clear that they will be able to. That is why, in a little bit bigger historical context of like five or ten years, this is an important moment because it is happening. Part of why there, and Mary Rowlandson describes several other raids on villages. She meets people who have been captured in other raids. Um, they, when she, uh, one of the Native Americans brings her a Bible, um, he has brought it. His, he has it because he got it during a raid. There are all these raids that are happening during King Philip's War by the Native Americans. But by the time you get to the end of King Philip's War, those raids are over, the Native American resistance. Um, many of those Native Americans have fled into what is now like upstate New York or up into Canada around the Great Lakes because it has become clear that, that they're not gonna be able to stop the British colonists and the English army from like pressing how, you know, wet further and further west. And Mary Rowlandson, it's important to note, uh, she is eventually marched. She is captured in what is now central Massachusetts. She is marched across all of western Massachusetts, north and west, um, into what is now New Hampshire and Vermont. Like, she has marched a pretty long way into what, for the English, would have been the wilderness. But there's clearly, as she tells you multiple times, these Native American villages, and they know where they're going. And um, but you can see right here, she marches a pretty significant way. That's part of what's important about the King Philip's War part of this is the Native Americans carry her here because like this is a safe space for them. But by the time you get to the end of King Philip's War, a year or two after this, like it's clear that the Native Americans are not gonna be able to res resist the English army and the sort of westward push of the frontier. So let's jump into the book. Uh, what you get in that first section before the removes start, there's 20 removes, and what she means by moves is movements. Whether they move just like three quarters of a mile or eight or 10 miles in a day, she, she divides the book into these chapters called removes because it is when they move from one place or another. And sometimes they're in one place for two or three weeks, and sometimes they're in one place just for a night, and then they move on. Um, before you get into the removes, you get that beginning, which describes the attack on uh, her house and on the town of Lancaster. Her house was a garrison house. Garrison houses were designed to, those were places where if the town was attacked, you would run to those designated garrison houses because they were built up and had some walls built at the corners, some sort of triangular walls where people could get behind and shoot. They were made to be defensible um, because part of what she describes is her house stays defensible. The garrison works until they set the roof on fire and then everybody has to flee because they can't put the roof out. Um, that is the end of the ability to defend the garrison house. She says, 10th of February, 1675, came the Indians with great numbers of Paul Lancaster. There's the attack. She, in that first paragraph, talks about the garrison, the garrison houses. There's a couple of garrison houses in their town. Um, at length, they came and beset our own house. That's that second paragraph. Quickly, it was the dolefulest day that ever mine eyes saw. House stood upon the edge of a hill. And she describes in that second paragraph, again, they are able to pretty successfully defend her house, the garrison house, and there's like 30 people in it, um, until the Native Americans succeed in uh, setting the roof on fire. But they quickly fired it again, and that took, now is the dreadful hour come. That dreadful hour, it's because they have, they can't stay in the house anymore and they have to flee. Um, some in our house were fighting for their lives, others wallowing in their blood, the house on fire over our heads, and the bloody heathen ready, ready to knock us on the head. She says several times, knock us on the head. That is like being tomahawk, um, something like what we would call a tomahawk, um, but them being people knocked unconscious or outright killed by something like a tomahawk or a hammer or something like that, a common Native American weapon. They run from the house, and then there's this description in that second paragraph where she and Sarah, her daughter, who is six years old, and she's carrying Sarah. Um, the bullets flying thick, one went through my side, uh, somewhere above her hip, around her stomach, and the same as would seem through the bowels and the hand of my dear child in her arms. So she was only shot once, but the bullet, the ball, because they didn't have bullets back then, the ball goes through her side, and then because of how she was carrying her child, through the stomach and the hand of her daughter, Sarah. One of my elder sister's children named William then had his leg broken. My eldest sister being yet in the house and seeing these woeful sights, uh, 
the infidels hauling mothers one way and children another and her elder son telling her that her son William was dead and myself was wounded she said our Lord let me die with them which was no sooner said but she was struck with a bullet and fell down dead and so she, Rowlandson sees her um, sister shot and killed in front of her but to return the Indians laid hold of us pulling me one way the children another she and Sarah stay together the wounded six-year-old but her older um, son and daughter who she sees later encounters later multiple times um, they are they are taken by other Native Americans into another group oh the doleful sight that now was to behold uh, at this house come behold the works of the Lord what desolation he has made in the earth um, that is also you get multiple times in this book she references the Bible and connects either comforts herself with some verse from the Bible or more importantly connects her experience to uh, experiences or activities described in the book which is a form of typology connecting your life and your experiences for Christians connecting their lives or experiences to particular events or characters you make this sort of personal connection to events described in the Christian Bible, whether it's the Hebrew Old Testament or the New Testament. Um, at the bottom of that, she makes one of the things that one of the things that she connects herself to is Job. There's an entire book in the Old Testament called the Book of Job. It is generally understood, but Job is this character who is very wealthy, um, very faithful, very devoted Christian. He has all of his wealth, his children, his lands are destroyed um, through this attack by the devil, Satan. Um, but he remains faithful to God, and it is this sort of test of faith th through suffering and trials and tribulations. Mary Rowlandson very much connects herself to that experience. She, can, she quotes Job, I believe, five times or connects her experience to Job. Um, five times through the course of this book. The first one is in that paragraph that begins, Oh, the doleful sight that now is to behold our house. Um, because she says, Of 37 persons who were in this one house, none escaped either present death or bitter captivity, save only one. And it's important to note that save only one is not her because she is taken captive. She says only one person is either not killed or taken captive. So that's not her. That's somebody else that was in her house taking shelter. Um, that one person, not her, escapes and flees to the nearest town and tells everybody that Lancaster has been attacked. And she says, then she quotes Job, and I only am escaped alone to tell the news. That's a line from Job where one of Job's properties is destroyed and only one server, uh, servant survives the attack and runs to tell Job that it's been attacked. And so like in that instance in Job, in the book of Job, in the Hebrew Old Testament, um, only one person from her house survives either being killed or captured and then flees to a nearby town to tell them to tell what has happened in Lancaster. Um, 24 of us were taken alive and carried captive. Uh, so 24 people in her house survived the attack and then 13 others are killed during the attack. Uh, I had often, and then the famous, the last little paragraph of this section is famous because she says, I had often before this said that if the Indians should come, I should choose rather to be killed than taken alive. But when it came to the trial, and what she means by trial is when it came to the moment when that, like when she was tested, my mind changed. Their glittering weapons daunted my spirit. I chose rather to go along with those, as I may say, ravenous beasts. And so she was like, I'd rather, you know, she'd always theoretically thought I'd rather die than be taken captive. But when somebody was standing there in front of her with like a tomahawk, she's like, ah, nah, I think I'd rather be taken captive. When when that belief is tested, she's like, no, nah, I'd, I'd rather not just be killed right here. That and Then you get into the first remove, and she tells you right there, that first remove, they really only go about a mile away from the attack to a hill where they can, she and they can still see the town. Um, oh, the roaring and singing and dancing, yelling, yelled those black creatures in the night, which made the place a lively resemblance of hell. This is another important moment where she connects the Native Americans to like demons or barbarians or something along those lines. Um, all was gone. My husband was gone, at least separated from me, he being in the bay. That's where she explains that the reason her husband is not captured here is because he's away in Massachusetts Bay. There remained nothing to me but one poor wounded bay. That's her daughter, Sarah, the six-year-old. Seemed at present worse than death as it was in such a pitiful condition. Again, because the baby, the, the ball has passed through um, both the baby's hand and her stomach. Uh, 
And there's also the last paragraph is sort of notable here. Those seven that were killed at Lancaster the summer before upon a Sabbath day, she makes a reference to praying Indians. One of the ways that the natives attempted to survive um, this, this sort of westward push and westward expansion of the colonists was to convert to Christianity and become praying Indians. What she is describing here is, in her mind, you can't trust a praying Indian. No, no Native American is trustworthy. And she says the praying Indians are almost like double agents. That, because they're praying Indians, they can go into towns and civilization, but they will also, like she says, um, these people uh, that, that are praying Indians were involved in some of these raids during King Philip's War, too. So she's making this argument that, that, that the Native Americans are dangerous and possibly not capable of being converted. And they are often like manipulating the sort of notion of praying Indians to like work as double agents, as spies in the colonies. She understandably does not have a very high opinion of the Native Americans, um, which there's some discussion about how that's at odds with her Christian faith and the notion that like everybody could be converted or Christianized, um, especially since she's the wife of a, of a minister. Um, you have to sort of, you can decide as you read how to read or understand her interactions with the Native Americans. They're clearly colored by the fact that like they, she sees them kill, you know, multiple members of her family, including her youngest daughter. Um, but her depiction of them is, is above all the idea that they are not trustworthy, that they are liars, which she at, turn, she at times connects to like the the Christian notion of the devil, one of the traits of the devil or Satan is being a liar. And so she makes this connection between them. You get to the second remove, but now the next morning I must turn my back upon the town, travel with them into the vast and desolate wilderness. Again, her sense that she is going away from civilization. Her, Lancaster was on the frontier between civilization and the wilderness, despite the fact that it was settled by the Native Americans. And going to the desolate wilderness, I knew not whither. Uh, there is the, the famous scene from the second remove is the Native Americans allow her to, her to carry Sarah on a horse, but then they go down this really steep hill and it's so steep that she and um, Sarah fall off of the horse, which is clearly not helpful to Mary Rowlandson, who is, still has this wound in her side. At length, I took it off the horse and carried it in my arms till my strength fell and fell down. Um, but she uh, and Sarah fall off of the horse, clearly not great. After this, it quickly began to snow. Again, you have to remember that it's February in New England, and so a lot of what's happening, especially in the first removes, is they're surviving like freezing cold temperatures. It's snowing. Um, they stopped, and now down I must sit in the snow by a little fire with my sick child in my lap, calling much for water, being now fallen into a violent fever. I, Sarah's clearly like, her little girl is clearly struggling uh, and has a fever because of this wound. My own wound also growing so stiff that I could scarce sit down or rise up. Yet I must sit, yet I must sit all this cold winter night upon the cold snowy ground, my sick child in my arms, looking at every hour will be the last of its life. A lot of this is this sort of, you feel like she's still in a little bit of shock from all that has happened and she's watching her child get sicker and sicker in these first few removes. Um, the beginning of the third remove, one of the things, that, things that's important, one of the ways you can read this book and sort of track is what she has to eat or drink and what she is willing to eat and drink. Um, but she says you get the first chunk of that is at the um, third remove because she said, it may be easily judged what poor feeble condition we were in. There being not the least crumb of refreshing that came within either of our mouths from Wednesday night to Saturday night, except only a little cold water. So they don't have anything to eat from Wednesday night, from that first Wednesday night, they're captured to Saturday night except a little cold water. Um, obviously not great in, under any conditions and especially not after you've been shot. Um, that, this day in the afternoon, about an hour by sun, we came to the place where they intended an Indian town. Again, it's important to note that as much as she calls this the wilderness, they pass through Native American towns that are settled and are clearly towns, even she recognizes as towns. Um, the next day was the Sabbath and I then remembered how careless I'd been of God's holy time and she is thinking about like how uh, this situation changes her perspective on things including like the Sabbath and resting on the Sabbath day part of the Christian tradition um, there is also this incident on 
uh, in, in that first paragraph where she interacts with a man named Robert Pepper who has been a captive longer than her. He has been ca he was captured in an earlier raid before the attack on her town in Lancaster. And he tells her, he told me, he himself was wounded in the leg at Captain Beer's fight. And he took oak leaves and laid them to his wound and through the blessing of God, he was able to travel again. Thus I took oak and leaves and laid to my side and with the blessing of God, it cured me also. And she takes these leaves from an oak tree, uses them as a kind of bandage and it essentially for her heals her wound. Um, I must say there's some more typology right in there. I may say as it is in Psalm, my wounds stink and are corrupt. I am troubled, I am bowed down. I go mourning all the day long. Uh, unfortunately, the oak leaves as a bandage do not work for Sarah, probably because Sarah's, her daughter's stomach is punctured and, and it's, you know, at a, at a certain point you need like more than just a bandage for some, a wound like that. And then you get that the second full paragraph. This was the comfort I had from them. Miserable comforters are y'all. That's another Job typology, another piece of typology, another reference to Job, to the book of Job. Um, about two hours in the night, my sweet babe, like a lamb, departed this life on February 18th, 1675, it being about six years and five months old. Nine days from the first wounding um, in this miserable condition without any refreshing except a little cold water. And it's obviously a very traumatic moment, a very dark moment for her, a very traumatic experience. Um, she says, one of the most striking moments of this, I cannot but take notice at how another time I could not bear to be in the room where any dead person, so she used to not want to be around dead people, couldn't stand it. I'm, I must and could lie down by my dead babe side by side all the night after. I have thought since of the wonderful goodness of God and to me in preserving me in the use of my reason and senses it, that I did not use wicked and violent means to end my own miserable life. One of the ways that you can read this book too is to sort of track her shock and trauma and post-traumatic stress. And here you see clearly her child dies and she sleeps with it all night and, and contemplates suicide and has to resist thoughts of, of killing herself. You also get the first identification of her master, the person who has who is in control of her, um, is a Native American whose name is Quinnipin. You find out later that Quinnipin has three wives and Mary Rowlandson, through most of this of this of her captivity, is a servant to the second of Quinnipin's wives, who is a um, woman named Weedamu or Weedamore, depending on how you pronounce that. Um, Quinnipin has those three wives. Um, she is the servant to the middle wife. Um, and then, um, and Quinnipin is, she mentions Quinnipin and is important here uh, because Quinnipin, when they wake up in the morning and realize that her child has died, Quinnipin forces her to leave the baby in the wigwam, which is a kind of tent that they used as they travel, almost like a teepee, but, but really more sort of wider and squatter because you would lay, make this framework of sticks or branches and then lay uh, furs on top of it as a shelter. Um, they, Quinnipin forces her to leave Sarah's body in the wigwam and they make her go somewhere else. And then either Weedamu or some of the other uh, women, Native Americans, take the baby and bury it. And when she comes back, the baby is Sarah's buried. They show her where they buried Sarah. Um, then they went uh, when I came, I asked them what they had done with it. Then they told me it was upon the hill. They went and showed me where it was. I saw the ground newly dig, and they told me they had buried it. There I left that child in the wilderness and must commit it and myself, also in this wilderness condition, to him who is above all. Come in our, you know, God's going to take care of us. God, having taken away this dear child, I want to see my daughter Mary, who is at this same Indian town. And right here she is able to... There is this sort of what she reads is this comfort, which is that after Sarah dies and is buried, this is the first time that she's able to see both her daughter Mary and her son Joseph right after that. Um, she sees Mary. Uh, I had one child dead, another in the wilderness, and I knew not where, and the third they would not, not let me come near to. Uh, she sees Mary. Uh, she sees her son Joseph. With tears, when she sees Joseph, with tears in his eyes, he asked me whether his sister Sarah was dead, told me he had seen his sister Mary, and prayed me that I would not be troubled in reference to, um, to himself. Uh, and then that last section of this chapter uh, is the 
um, Native Americans come back from an attack on Medfield, which was another frontier town. Um, this is when one of the Native Americans gives her a Bible. One of the Indians that came from the Medfield fight had brought some plunder, came to me and asked if I would have a Bible. He had got one in his basket. I took the Bible, and in that melancholy time, it came to my mind to read the 28th chapter of Deuteronomy, which I did. And when I read it, my dark heart wrought in this manner. Um, you get some typology. She has the Bible in front of her to reference right there. Um, and she says, if we would return to him by repentance, though we were scattered from one end of the earth to the other, let, yet, yet the Lord would gather us together and turn all those curses upon our enemies. And again, she connects this to her experience because like, there is the idea that we are scattered from one end of the earth and her children are scattered all over the place and her husband's one place and she's in the wilderness. But if they, she believes that if they would have faith, they would, the Lord would gather us together again, which is obviously outside of Sarah who can't come back from the dead. Um, in her mind, that does, that is how it ends up working out. Uh, that last paragraph of the third remove, um, she has this interaction with this pregnant woman who is, the suggestion is around eight or eight and a half months pregnant. Um, the pregnant woman who she, the woman, good wife Jocelyn, told me she should never see me again and that she should find it in her heart to run away. I wished her not to run away by any means for we were near 30 miles from any English town, and she was very big with child. This is an important moment in the book because Mary Rowlandson realizes that at this point, they are so far away from the frontier and from the English colonies that they probably couldn't find their way back. Like running away isn't really, for even for her, and especially not for this very pregnant woman, running away is not really an option anymore because they're so far into the wilderness that running away and getting home, it's not a practical reality. Now, and then the fourth remove, now I must part with that little company. Here I parted from my daughter Mary and from four little cousins and neighbors. Um, she gives you this sort of follow-up where she goes away from the pregnant woman, um, but they tell her that they killed the pregnant woman and the pregnant woman's child because she kept complaining. The suggestion there, one of the things that you can get out of this book, um, and especially after the death of Sarah, Mary Rollinson's daughter, is that what the Native Americans want is somebody that can travel with them and not be a lot of trouble, that can adapt and survive. Mary Rowlandson proves that she can do that, which is why she survives and is eventually traded back. Um, the pregnant woman is for the Native Americans on a very basic and ugly level, more trouble than she's worth. You know, if you're eight months pregnant, you, you can't travel that well. You're about to give birth. You've got a small child who also can't travel or take care of themselves. And so then for the Native Americans, there seems there is this very practical reality of like prisoners are only worth keeping around if they can travel and help us and, and also be traded back for some money. Uh, and the, as in that first chapter of the fourth remove, they tell her that the pregnant woman is killed because she's just too much trouble in a very basic, dark way. Um, heart aching thoughts here I had about my poor children. My head was light and dizzy. Um, and then you get some more typology where she quotes from the Christian Bible, thus saith the Lord, refrain thy voice from weeping in the night, eyes from tears. Um, and she sort of like comforts herself and like makes herself feel better and, and pulls herself out of this depression that she's in. You get the fifth remove. What's important about the fifth remove is the English army who is trying to stop these raids and fight the Native Americans comes very close to catching the Native Americans right here. Um, what prevents the, it is they came to the Bangquag River upon a Friday, a little afternoon, we came to this river and Mary Rollinson says that the Native Americans are able to build rafts and cross, either wade across the river or build rafts and help the people across the river who can't just wade across it. Um, and the English army gets to this river and is for one reason or another, not able to or decides not to cross this river um, and so she is not uh, rescued or what she would call redeemed at this point. Um, they quickly fell to cutting dry trees to make rafts to carry them over the river and soon my, my turn came to go over. By the advantage of some brush which they laid upon the raft I did not wet my foot. Right in that moment she has this another typology example I was not before acquainted with such kinds of doings or dangers like crossing the river on a little raft. But then you get this quote from the Bible, 
when thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. And so again, you get this very specific typology where she connects her experience to some activity or image in the Bible. If you want to come, there's also a big food image here where she eats. On the Saturday, they boiled an old horse's leg, which they had got, and so we drank of the broth as soon as they thought it was ready. And it was almost all gone, they filled it up again. Um, one of the again, one of the ways you can track this is to see what she is, what she will eat and is willing to eat to survive. And at this point, she is eating horse leg broth soup. Uh, not great, but if you're starving, hey, you'll take it. Um, the, and she explains the food stuff right after that. The first week of my being among them, I hardly ate anything, but the second week, I found my stomach grow very faint for want of something. Yet it was very hard to get down their filthy trash like horse leg soup. But the third week, though, I could think how formally my stomach would turn against this or that, and I could starve and die before I could eat such things if they were sweet and savory to my taste. And so her point is, you know, like, you go three weeks with not really eating, you'll eat anything, and it'll, it'll be good, and it'll taste good. Um, there is also multiple times in these sections her description of her knitting uh, stockings or pants or shirts for people and trading that, that for food or for... At one point, she trades some knitting for a knife. Um, I was at this time knitting a pair of white cotton stockings for my mistress and had not yet wrought, wrought upon a Sabbath day. They forced her to work on Sunday, which is something she is against as a Christian. Um, and then that last section ends with her explaining they're able to cross the river. The English army is not. We were not ready for so great a mercy as victory and deliverance. Uh, um, and then you jump to the sixth remove, which is my, it's it's um, gone from February to March. The sixth remove happens on March sixth. On Monday, they set their wigwams on fire and went away. It was a cold morning, and before us there was a great brook with ice on it. So again, it's still winter in New England. They're having to cross these little streams uh, with ice in them. I did not wet my foot. I went along that day, mourning and lamenting, leaving farther my own country. There's also this important typological moment right there in the first few sentences of the sixth remove. I understood something of Lot's wife's temptation when she looked back. If you're familiar with the story of Lot's wife in the um, Hebrew Old Testament, it goes to the story of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah in the Old Testament. And Lot uh, and his family are faithful Christians and God tells them to leave these cities of the plain, Sodom and Gomorrah, because he's going to destroy them in a firestorm. Um, but the one rule is they have to leave town and not and go into the wilderness and not look back. Lot's wife, though, looks back on her home and leaving, you know, everything she's ever known. And because of that, she is punished by God and turned into a column, a pillar of salt. Um, Mary Rowlandson says, like, I understood Lot's wife's sort of impulse to look back and, and see her home and think about where she had come from right here. So she connects herself to Lot's wife um, and has sympathy for her. When I came to the brow of the hill that looked toward the swamp, I thought we had come to a great Indian town. Um, again, this is an important moment because it shows that the Native Americans, it's not just wilderness. There is this Native American civilization and all these Native Americans and um, in the wilderness which is not wilderness to them, it's civilization, but for her, it's, it's the roaring wilderness. And then you get the seventh remove. Um, after a restless and hungry night there, we had a wearisome time of it. Again, it's early March. Um, she talks about how, I thought my heart and legs and all would have broken and failed me, what through faintness and soreness of body, it was a grievous day of travel, about how she is sort of struggling with all of the walking and traveling. Um, she is carrying a sort of wicker basket um, like what we'd think of as almost like a backpack made out of wicker on her back. Um, that day, a little afternoon, we came to Squaqueeg, where the Indians quickly spread themselves over some deserted English fields, gleaning what they could. Some picked up ears of wheat that were crickled. Some found ears of Indian corn. If you don't know what Indian corn is, it is that multicolored corn. It's not just plain yellow corn. That's what she's distinguishing right there. Myself got two, in ear two ears of Indian corn. While I did... But turn my back, one of them was stolen from me, which much troubled me. There came an Indian at that time with a basket of horse liver, and I asked him to give me a piece. What, says he, can you eat horse liver? I told him I would try. 
if he would give me a piece, which he did. I laid it on the coals to roast, but before it was half ready, they got half of it away from me so that I was fain to take the rest and eat it, was, eat it as it was with the blood about my mouth. And yet a savory bit it was to me, for to the hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet. That's in another important food moment because Shirsi is eating raw, bloody horse liver rather than risk rather than risk somebody else getting it and eating it. And she eats it like it's both raw and hot because it's been on the cold. It's hot enough to burn her mouth, but she's so hungry. She's like, I'm don't I'm not going to give you all a chance to steal any more of this. I'll eat it bloody and, and scalding hot because I'm so hungry. For to the hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet. That night, we had a mess of wheat for our supper because of the wheat that they were able to pick from this old English farm settlement there. Um, that gets you, the seventh remove gets you, they are still marching west there in western Massachusetts. You have gone from early February to early March, so she's about a month in um, to these travels. She is, as she tells you, she's adapting, both in terms of like being able to physically march around with them, able to survive on the little bit of food that they are eating, like whether she's eating horse leg soup or horse liver or all these different things that they are eating. She says that like her stomach is adapted to eating this food. She is adapting to like marching around and surviving. A lot of the first third is her going through the shock of being captured and the shock and trauma of losing her daughter. And then after the death of Sarah, her adapting to being able to march around and be a prisoner and survive this way. Um, that gets you through the first third. Uh, just very briefly, I will show you. Um, this is from uh, the cover of an early edition of this book. It's always pointed out, Mary Rowlandson never has a gun and never talks about shooting anybody or having a gun, but she was depicted in these early um, printings as this sort of survivalist. And you get this picture of her with a, holding an, a rifle. Um, and if you can see what's in her other hand, and it's a horn of powder, which you would use to put powder in the gun and fire a ball. There is, Lancaster is not a town anymore. Um, it was never rebuilt after, the, after this destruction. In fact, there is a marker. You can see where Lan the town of Lancaster used to be there. Um, and then there is a marker uh, um, commemorating the raid. Um, here is the cover of the first edition of the book. Covers of books used to have this sort of like, instead of pictures or anything, they'd have the title and then a description of what the book is about. And then there's a picture of this um, historical marker at Redemption Rock, which we're not there yet, but Redemption Rock is where Native Americans and the English colonists would trade um, prisoners back. You would be redeemed out of captivity and back home, which she will eventually get to. She will be redeemed at Redemption Rock. And then you see there the map of how far she goes. Um, she's going, like I said, into Western Massachusetts and then up into what is now New Hampshire and Vermont. There is also the response for this topic is how does Mary Rowlandson shape her experience through biblical stories and theology? Um, and you can't completely answer that yet because we're just in the first third of the book. But look especially at her language choice, the way she talks about herself, the way she thinks about um, herself and her children versus the Native Americans, the structure of her narrative, her editorial asides, like when she tells you how she used to not be able to eat these things, but now she can, um, and her depictions of Natives and, and Americans, um, like Natives and then the colonists is what I mean right there. Um, you obviously want to get at least a little further into the book before you answer this, but think about how she describes the native, how she describes her experience, especially how she connects her experience to Christianity and the Bible and, and connects herself over and over again to these biblical stories like Lot's wife and like Job surviving these traumas and struggles. So hopefully this is helpful to you in answering this response. If you want to write about this, this is, in the, when I've taught this class in the past, this is a response that is pretty popular and a lot of students like to write about because there's so much um, she gives you so much and so many ways to answer this question. Hope that's helpful to you, and I hope y'all are doing well. Thanks.